Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. This episode is episode 2 in our series on Huey P. Long, The Campaign Trail. Huey Long pulled a man aside once and conspiratorially explained his plans for 1924. He said, quote, I'm going to run for governor, and let me tell you how I'm going to win. In every parish there's a boss, usually the sheriff. He has 40% of the votes. Now 40% are opposed to him. The other 20% are in betweens. I'm going to go into every parish and cuss out the boss. That gives me 40% of the votes, and I'll horse trade them out of the in betweens. In Huey's eyes, he had it all figured out. Of course, you can argue that cussing out the authority figures in every local parish is going to make you a lot of enemies. And in a state where the police forces regularly help their citizens vote for the right candidates, it seems like a risky strategy. But in many ways, Huey didn't have a choice. As early as his first run in 1924, he was already committed to a brand of insurrectionary, revolutionary politics. His response to any criticism from the establishment was to double down, rail against them, imply that they were in the pay of big corporations and not on the side of the people. Dissatisfaction with the powers that be and with the status quo in Louisiana. Well, this was Huey's bread and butter. He'd yelled about the Standard Oil criminals, the octopus, Well, if every local sheriff is a tentacle on that octopus, Huey was their sworn enemy. Huey already knew that he wasn't going to secure the endorsements of the political machines, like the old regulars or new regulars in Louisiana. He was far too radical. He was far too radical and nowhere near the kind of compliant kind of candidate they'd normally back. Without their support, his only hope was to subvert the entire political system as it existed in Louisiana. And if that meant denouncing a lot of people, well, what did it matter? In Huey's mind, they stood between him and power. They were already his enemies, and by extension, the enemies of the people. He had some justification for portraying himself as something different, a real alternative to the establishment. Huey's position as public service commissioner on the railroads, fighting legal cases for the little guy, had made his reputation. A local reporter described how the people felt about Huey Long in 1921. They don't know Huey Long. They never saw him, and they would not know him if he stepped off their train at the station but they know him in name, and you can't make them believe that he's not their defender. Huey was constantly complaining about the biased newspapers, who, in his mind, never gave him his due. In his autobiography, he makes a point of quoting every editorial from the Louisiana press that was pro-long in the early 1920s. And, tellingly, the last one is a grudging admission that Huey had been responsible for winning the telephone case, the case that had resulted in $400,000 more in the pockets of the people. It's as if Huey is saying... Even the crooked media who are in the pay of big corporations have to tell the truth. I'm on your side. These editorials, along with a whole set of circulars, they were distributed by Huey to thousands of homes in Louisiana. And when the press didn't back him, he'd print his own editorials and send those around. But Huey had issues beyond the fact that the press didn't like him. Without political machine backing, he couldn't do the usual thing in Louisiana. The usual procedure was that you offer an entire ticket of candidates. They're all associated with you, and they're all backed by the old regulars or the new regulars. But Huey's campaign for governor was isolated, lacking in political support, and without the systematic structure of machine politics, where the whole slates of candidates would run together and endorse each other, he was struggling. In fact, the other candidates coordinated their efforts against him. With barely disguised bitterness, he recounts one occasion where two rival candidates made a last-minute excuses to avoid a public debate. He even boasts about the crowd size at that debate. Huey had written a speech with one of his classic, elaborate metaphors. He was going to describe the two candidates as eggs laid by the crooked governor, John M. Parker. But as he wryly noted, on an empty stage, this denunciation had less of a dramatic impact than he might have wanted. More of a concern was an issue on which Huey felt he couldn't come down strongly on one side or the other. The Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist racist organisation, well, they were still alive and kicking in Louisiana in the 1920s and they divided opinion in the state. Some legislative efforts were put in place to forcibly unmask them after they'd begun killing and lynching their political opponents. Now, Huey had a problem. He was from the north of Louisiana, where the KKK had a lot of support. If he denounced them, he'd lose his natural geographic base. If he came down in favour of them, he would lose the southern votes that he needed to win the election. Also, going on record as endorsing the KKK would probably harm his future political career. You have to remember that Huey was planning to run for president, and having such a backward organisation would not exactly make him a national candidate. 
As well as this, a lot of KKK supporters represented the vested interests and the wealthy in Louisiana society, and so they already distrusted Huey for his populist radicalism. So, endorsing the KKK wouldn't necessarily help him either. In the meantime, his rival candidates had clear positions on the issue. But whenever Huey was asked about his views, he was in this considerable bind, so he dodged the question in the time-honoured manner of politicians who'd been cornered. One of his rivals was vehemently anti-Klan, and the other was a moderate, who probably hoped to get the Klan vote by failing to denounce them. Huey was forced to deny being a member of the Klan after rumours spread in the press. It seems clear that the other candidates wanted to use the KKK as a wedge to galvanise support for them, and with Huey's ambivalence on the issue, he was outflanked on both sides. Huey described the injection of the KKK issue into the campaign of 1924. He said, quote, The state, aroused and divided by bitter religious conflict, cleverly manipulated by the corporations and the newspapers, left me out of the running in many places. Now, in terms of Huey's own racism, this is a difficult question. I feel like, essentially, he was perfectly willing to be racist and use racist rhetoric when it won him support and he was perfectly willing not to when it didn't win him support. Ultimately, the concerns of the oppression of black people were not really his main concern. It was all for him about getting into power. But he wasn't a virulent racist in the way that some of the politicians of the day were. By our standards, he would be considered a racist without doubt. But for the time, he was something of a moderate for Louisiana. Another issue was the classic one for outsider candidates, campaign funding. Running a campaign for the governorship was not cheap, especially if you wanted to do as much travelling and public speaking as Huey did. Having irritated all the major corporate backers, and without campaign contributions from political machines, Huey had the smallest campaign war chest of the three candidates by a long way. Instead, he relied on his own personal magnetism and restless energy. In a typical 20-hour day, Huey would speak in several towns, shake hundreds of hands, and cross many miles. He was also aware of the possibilities offered to him by new media, This would allow him to bypass the traditional gatekeepers of the press, who were, in his view, unforgivably biased. In Louisiana, in the 1920s, the new medium was the radio. Huey was one of the first Louisiana politicians to use it to his advantage, broadcasting mainly to New Orleans. His strategy in these speeches, along with advancing his populist programme and promoting infrastructure, was to attack viciously every single one of his opponents. By the strategy of relentless offensive, Huey covered up for a lack of his own coherent political programme and forced the focus of the debate endlessly back onto himself. But all the new media, free publicity, and whirlwind activism in the world couldn't overcome the institutional barriers against Huey in 1924. And, if you're willing to believe in the pathetic fallacy, maybe something more. On election day and the night before, there was heavy rain, and some rural voters couldn't get to the polls as a result. The dirt roads, the roads that Huey had promised to rebuild in concrete, had washed away to mud. In the end, Huey lost the election. The rain probably didn't make a decisive difference, but he would elevate it in his autobiography, arguing that 40% of his rural vote had been lost to the downpour. The words of a man cleverly manipulating history, or one who can't face defeat? It was another hard luck story for the man who'd walked all night beside the railroad tracks to become a clerk. Now, this is pretty ridiculous, because the voter turnout in the rural regions that Huey was concerned with was much higher than normal. But in his defeat, there were the seeds of future victory. The newspapers had confidently predicted that a radical candidate like Huey could never get more than 25,000 votes. But in the end, he polled 74,000. Not all that far behind the leading candidate with 84,000. But more than this, it was the source of Huey's votes that represented the shock to the political system. He'd done this, he'd come a very creditable third, with no support from New Orleans and no political machine on his side. Those votes came from the very rural poor that Huey had spent so long canvassing and trying to shape into a real political force. Vast swathes of the state were prolonged in terms of territory. If you counted it by parish, Huey had a majority in as many parishes as the victor. Huey blamed the rain for his defeat and swore that the fight was only just beginning. But the failed campaign had taught him some vital lessons. First, it was possible to galvanise the rural poor of Louisiana to vote for him. They had already surprised all the pundits in their strong turnout. They were no fickle voter base who could be bought and sold by political machines. It was the way that Huey had made a name for himself, both in the law representing the little guy 
and in these freewheeling political rallies that visited towns that other candidates had shunned and never been to before. These people had been brought into political participation by him, and they would surely remain loyal to him. But Huey learned secondly, if he was going to win decisively, he would need to get some votes from New Orleans. Huey visited the city and met with several people, including Robert Ewing, who published an influential New Orleans newspaper. Ewing probably thought that he could influence a young and naive Huey, and, like many others, he was enticed by this base of popular support that he'd managed to tap into. So Huey threw himself into the shifting alliances and murky allegiances of New Orleans politics. He attempted to intervene in a local race there. He curried favour with the new regular political faction. Huey promised that, if he was elected governor, the new regular cronies would all be given cushy government jobs. He was not above the slick game-playing of politics in Louisiana, with its heel turns and its backroom deals. It's just that, as soon as he was elected, he planned to throw the chessboard out of the window. In the four years between 1924 and 1928, Huey's efforts were concentrated in two parallel political projects, entering the fray of New Orleans backroom politics with his association with Ewing, and continuing to build his populist reputation with his railroad commissioner position and his legal career. Louisiana politics had something of the professional wrestling sense of drama to it. Political alliances were made to be broken as much as they were made for anything else. For this reason, Huey supported, at first, the Senate candidature of Joseph Rancel. There were few politicians further from Huey's own kind. Rancel's career had followed a classic trajectory. He studied law, he became a congressman for 12 years, and then a senator for another 12 years. The classic establishment candidate. By the time Huey lost his first race in 1924, he'd been in Congress or the Senate for 24 years. But Rancel was a Catholic and Huey needed Catholic votes from the south of Louisiana, who still mistrusted him and his rumoured association with the KKK. So everything he did in these years, it was with an eye to the specific demographics of Louisiana, and how he could win. Huey spent some time in his speeches of 1925 praising the establishment candidate, the extremely conservative Ranzel, sometimes more than he praised himself. Huey hoped that Ranzel would remember the favour and return it in 1928, so that he'd have an establishment voice on his side when he tried again to run for governor. Huey needed support in the Catholic South to win the election, and one of the quirky traditions of Louisiana politics helped him in the same. There was this system of patronage that really, really reminds you of the Roman Republican system. So it was the tradition that the rich men of the parishes led the poor towards voting, in a sort of patron-client model. In the Roman system, many of the city's poor made their living purely from handouts from the rich, it was a sign of social status to be an upstanding man about town, and support the poor and needy while maintaining your own obscene wealth. And in exchange, you could rely on their social support and their political support. They would vote the way you told them to. Many of these rich big dogs supported Huey because he was so popular amongst their young clients. And as his exploits gained more and more attention, some of them started to drift to his side. A major case that's worth talking about in the intervening years was the case of the New Orleans Toll Bridge, Huey's autobiography, which we've already said, spins everything wonderfully. In it, he says he's ready and willing to settle down and pursue no further political ambitions after his first defeat as governor. Yeah, right. He describes how happy and contented he is with his wife and young family, fighting his noble legal cases and making a decent living. Then the next chapter is titled, The Toll Bridge Outrage. New Orleans needed bridges to connect it to the growing network of roads in the state, and there was bitter debate over whether this should be a free bridge paid for by government money, or a toll bridge that would be funded by the users. J.Y. Sanders, one of Huey's political opponents and a friend of the current governor, proposed a plan for the toll bridge, and Huey leapt on the opportunity to attack a political rival. Huey could not disguise his insurgent brand of politics. He couldn't pretend to be a member of the establishment, and he knew that he could hardly rely on political alliances, which shifted with the wind. He had to completely discredit the establishment, so, with wild allegations that the toll bridge was a corrupt project to personally benefit Sanders and his political allies, he hoped to draw a line between himself and the traditional politicians in the minds of the people. Harry Williams, in his great biography of Huey, describes a familiar political scene. Quote, Sanders observed the mounting barrage of charges, at first with anger and then with resignation. He attempted to deny them and was able to demonstrate that some of them were inaccurate. 
but he soon discovered that denials were fruitless. His factual rejoinders were not nearly as interesting to voters as Huey's lurid allegations. Moreover, by the time he'd nailed one story as false, Huey stated another one that needed to be met. Sanders was being placed in a position that to a politician is fatal. He was always on the defensive, always responding to moves of his opponent and never moving on his own. Quote, Huey sued the state and denounced the plan, proposing his own alternative free bridge. Go build that bridge, and before you finish it, I will be elected governor and I will have free bridges right beside it, Huey bragged. The bridge issue was perfect for him. Infrastructure projects were already on his political agenda as a wise populist move, and this gave him his chance to lobby votes for New Orleans citizens who didn't want to pay a toll, and it let him paint his opponents as corrupt crony capitalists, willing to sell the people down the river, or at least make them pay to cross the river. Huey, in his autobiography, describes, It was practically impossible for me not to be moved into the sea of this fight. And so, despite his best efforts to be rid of politics, he found himself reluctantly campaigning for governor again in 1928. The political establishment was under no illusions that they would have to unite to defeat him. In July of 1927, three former governors, Ruffin Pleasant, John Parker and Sanders, staged a meeting. Also attending, as Huey gleefully reports, were members of Standard Oil's Octopus and representatives of New Orleans political machines. There was one item on the agenda at this meeting. Pick a candidate who could defeat Huey Long. They made no bones about attacking him during the meeting. Pleasant called him a coward with the conduct of an egg-sucking yellow dog and a man who lies with a craven heart like a white-livered popinjay. Other attendees compared him to a Bolshevik. Just ten years before, socialism had taken over the Russian Empire. It was a considerable threat. Huey was perfectly willing to denounce the conference right back, saying that it was a stench in the nostrils of good people, a candidate handpicked by a set of plunderbunders. Not that the elite had many outstanding candidates to choose from. The incumbent governor was an alcoholic who gambled prolifically when he wasn't making dull, uninspiring speeches. He wasn't even elected, but had assumed the governorship when the previous governor died. The incumbent governor would also run his race, splitting the establishment vote. In the end, the gathering settled on Riley Joe Wilson, a 14-year congressman from Huey's own Wynn Parish. Riley Joe had an advantage. He was in charge of flood control in the House of Representatives, and Louisiana had just had a massive flood in 1927, so his key issue was fresh in people's minds. But Riley Joe was no Huey P. Long. Despite similar origins, he didn't have the same homespun charm. He didn't have the outrageous platform of promises, or the track record of helping the little guy. He could rely on backing from the political machines, and from conservatives who opposed Huey bitterly. But there was little natural enthusiasm for Riley Joe as a candidate, save for the fact that he wasn't long. At that meeting, with thousands of delegates chanting, It won't be long now, you can already see that the opposition forces were running scared. They might have looked at the cheering crowds and seen a victory margin, but across the state many voters were disgusted with how openly the machine had played their hand. The rich and powerful in Louisiana had got together and selected a candidate to defeat Huey. It played into his narrative perfectly. Look at these people trying to buy the election from you, the people. When Huey was asked for his reaction to the convention, he said, That was a great convention. Give them rope. Huey was more than 20 years younger than his opponents. They were completely part of the establishment. Louisiana was a one-party state, but it was distinctly beginning to divide into two camps, pro-establishment and anti-establishment, pro-long and anti-long. Faced with a candidate he felt he could defeat, Huey went into overdrive, touring the little villages and towns of Louisiana. Whatever Riley Joe promised, Huey would outpromise. Whenever Riley Joe attacked his character, Huey came back with extra viciousness. In classic, four Yorkshiremen style, the two men even competed over who had been the most impoverished. When Riley Joe talked about going barefoot as a child in Wynn Parish, Huey snapped back, I can go on better, I was born barefoot. But Huey's campaign was not purely reactive. He had key issues, key policies that people recognised. Free school books for every child, a free bridge, improved roads, improved infrastructure, improved state hospitals, vocational education for the disabled, and funding for the education of poor, gifted children. It was an endless list, a litany, of utopian populist promises. The free school books were a particularly favoured issue. 
School textbooks were something of a racket in Louisiana. The approved textbooks regularly got changed, parents would have to buy them for their own children, and this cost up to $5 a year, which could practically price some people out of the educational market. Huey pointed out that Texas school kids got their books for free, at a cost of 90 cents a pupil. So this was a key, familiar, actionable issue. Every family in the state could relate to it. The same housewives he'd sold snake oil to for years could see that he had a real plan, a tangible plan to ease the financial burden on them. None of this was ever properly costed, of course. Huey vaguely talked of taxing corporations more, streamlining government, but he was never specific. When Wiley Joe announced his platform, it merely had watered-down versions of Huey's own ideas with a promise never to raise taxes. But Huey wasn't especially interested in fiscal responsibility, and none of his supporters were necessarily concerned with how he was going to pay for all this either. He had a dreamlike vision for the people of Louisiana. A catchy new slogan as well. Every man a king, but no one wears a crown. This phrase was so beloved by Huey that he made it the title of his new autobiography. He used it constantly through his political career, and he even composed a song about it which Randy Newman recorded. Every man a king, every man a king, for you can be a millionaire. If there's something belonging to others, there's enough for all people to share. When it's sunny June and December too, or in the winter time or spring, there'll be peace without end, every neighbour a friend, and every man a king. You can actually go on YouTube and see Huey in 1935 singing this song, along with his songwriter, Castro Carrazzo. I wouldn't say Huey had an amazing voice, and the song's more of an advertising jingle than anything else, but the sheer sense of the time you get from watching it is impressive. There's such an amazing contrast to now. I can't imagine a modern politician promoting their platform in a pop song that they sing. Maybe they should try it. The cornerstone of a Huey Long rally was his oratory. In this one campaign, he made as many as 600 speeches. Arms flailing, red-faced and passionate, he'd spit and denounce in long, run-on sentences. He was constantly on the move, letting loose the manic energy that seemed to propel him through his life. He had derogatory nicknames for his rivals. Riley Joe was Prince Riley. He attacked the establishment, saying, Our present state government has descended into a deplorable, misunderstood orgy of corporate dictatorship. His attacks weren't just verbal. In one infamous incident, he encountered Sanders, the man he denounced over the bridge, in a hotel lobby. The two descended into a physical fight, and while both of them claimed to have won afterwards, it was Huey who brandished part of Sanders' shirt that he'd torn off in the fight to a baying crowd. It was in the elevator that I gave him a good beating, Huey cried. But as well as robust attacks, he was also prone to populist melodrama, designed to promote an emotional reaction. He'd talk about the suffering of the poor. There's a story that Huey encouraged. There was a dinner held for him by a wealthy family. He was met with a vast array of cutlery and silver. If you've ever been at a formal dinner where people glare at you for using a soup spoon as a dessert spoon, you can probably picture the scene. Huey swept the knives and forks aside, crying, Bring me one knife and one fork, I don't know what to do with all this cutlery. It was a moment of apparent rash indiscretion and uncouth behaviour, but of course it was perfectly well calculated. Huey knew his supporters would spread the story and lap it up. At one campaign stop, he was by an oak tree that was featured in a famous poem. He said, quote, It is here, under this oak, where Evangeline waited for her lover, Gabriel, who never came. This oak is an immortal spot, made so by Longfellow's poem. But Evangeline is not the only one who waited here in disappointment. Where are the schools that you have waited for your children to have that have never come? Where are the roads and highways that you send your money to build that are no nearer now than ever before? Where are the institutions to care for the sick and disabled? Evangeline wept bitter tears in her disappointment, but it lasted for only one lifetime. Your tears in this country, around this oak, have lasted for generations. Give me the chance to dry the eyes of those who still weep here. But of course, Huey was not without his own political backers. His campaign finances, paid almost exclusively in cash so there would be no paper trail, came from a variety of sources. Robert S. Maestri, one of the wealthiest men in New Orleans, donated thousands of dollars to this campaign, and many more to Huey over the years. He had made his fortune with property in the Red Light District, and supplied most of the beds for New Orleans prostitutes, although he always vehemently denied this. Huey's secretary, Alice Lee Grosjean, was a close personal friend and confidant. She was tasked with carrying cash in bills hidden in her bosom, as Williams delicately writes. Despite what people who support Huey in glowing terms would have you believe, 
he was not immune to the machine politics of Louisiana. The same network of local sheriffs who corruptly controlled votes, local civic leaders who held sway in their communities and who'd back you in exchange for cushy jobs, and shady outside money, all this dominated Huey's campaign too. He was not an anti-corruption politician, despite what he said. He was not an anti-machine politician. Instead, Huey created his own machine. Williams describes Huey's machine as detaching rings and small groups from other machines, who were afraid that they'd lose their power and influence if they didn't throw their lot in with Huey's rising star. They came as subordinates, they had to come for their own self-preservation. Previous machines were a lot like gangs. They were bottom-up associations of figures with power and influence, who pooled their resources towards common goals and picked candidates who were loyal to them. But Huey's machine was top-down. The exact same species of swamp creature could be found in the long machine, but he chose them, and they owed their loyalty to personally to him. That was the difference, and it was a difference that would allow him to establish dictatorial control over the state of Louisiana in the coming years. There would be no debates amongst equals as to which candidate should be supported. Huey would dictate the candidate list. The media were perfectly happy to report the lurid and scintillating stories of Huey as the pro bono lawyer, bravely fighting against big corporations. He had a flair for drama, and he knew exactly how to tailor his actions to make the best story for media consumption. Newspapers then were just as driven by what captured the public attention as BuzzFeed is today. But endorsing Huey for governor was a bridge too far for most of the newspapers. One of them, the Homer Courier, described Huey as a disgusting buffoon. Quote, A thousand people witnessed a cheap vaudeville performance. The chief actor Long was uncouth in manner and speech, preaching demagoguery of such arrant type that almost every utterance was an affront to an intelligent audience. End quote. The New Orleans item railed against the promises that Huey couldn't keep, saying that he was pledging himself to cure the blind, deaf and deformed. Huey laughed off the media criticism by calling them dishonourable liars. Quote, One day you pick up the papers and see where I killed four priests. Another day I murdered twelve nuns. And the next day I poisoned 400 babies. I don't have time to answer all of them. End quote. He used new media that allowed him to talk to his followers directly, one of the earliest candidates to use radio broadcasts to appeal to the voters and broadcast his speeches. The hysteria on both sides likely didn't have too much of an impact on the race. As in all polarising times, people decide where they stand and then inevitably shuffle further and further towards that side. The middle ground? Well, it's eaten up by the political fire. This time, on election day, it didn't rain. If you're anything like me, you're sad enough that you stay up on election nights to watch the results come in live. Of course, in 1928, you couldn't do this on TV. You had to rely on verbal reports and hearsay. Initially, the anti-long camps might have been cheerful. The results from New Orleans came in first, and despite Huey's attempts to curry favour with the political machines in the city, he came in third, a long way behind the establishment candidates. He dismissively noted in his autobiography that the Ewing support had counted for little. It took until much later at night and in the early morning for the rural parish votes to be counted. Huey's heartland in the north of Louisiana showed up to support him, just as they had four years ago. But this time it was matched by gains in the rural south and Catholic French parishes. Huey's deal-making and his support of Senator Rancel in the intervening years had paid off. They had delivered enough of the rural parish votes to bypass the New Orleans political machine for the first time in decades. Politics was being reshaped by this election. The traditional divide between North and South had turned into a rural-urban divide, a prolong and anti-long divide. New Orleans was no longer the centre of political gravity, a must-win city. Huey won 126,842 votes. Riley Joe polled 81,747 while the incumbent Governor Simpson got 80,326. Since no candidate had an overall majority, the usual procedure was for a runoff election. But Huey headed this off at the pass. He went on a wild hunt for Governor Wilson, hoping for his endorsement. It's rumoured that the alcoholic governor was so difficult to find because, depressed at his showing, he'd indulged in a drinking bout and disappeared. All the while, he was hemorrhaging supporters to Huey. Personal loyalty counted for little, they just wanted to be on the side that was winning. When Huey found Simpson, presumably hung over and huddled in some dingy hotel room somewhere, the ex-governor knew that the events were only turning the situation to Huey's advantage. Utterly defeated, 
In exchange for a cushy job in the Long administration, he withdrew his candidacy and endorsed Huey. Later on, Riley Joe Wilson met with his supporters. Facing a long campaign with real momentum, and the prospect of having to raise thousands of dollars for a renewed runoff campaign, the old regulars and Wilson conceded to the inevitable. Huey Long had won the first round of the election by a greater margin than any previous candidate. He was going to be the next governor of Louisiana. In the drunken party that went on well into the night to celebrate victory, he was jubilant. You stick with me, boys, he said. We're only just getting started. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter at Autocracy Now, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating, review on iTunes or your favourite podcatcher, donate to the show. That way I don't have to streak in the middle of a football match with the logo painted on my back. No one wants to see that. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. Next time, we'll see Huey become the governor, and how the establishment reacts to the election of this demagogue. At first, the machine politicians and the wealthy vested interests of Louisiana. They might have thought they could control Long like any other politician. However, it soon became clear that he had the will and the desire to steamroll anything in his path, whether it was political opponents or the law of the land. The anti-Long forces soon realised that they had to try to eliminate him from politics altogether. We'll see how they do next episode. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zinadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A.bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode.